That's good. That's good.
Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. I just want to start by saying a massive, massive welcome to Marxism 2023. My name is Samira and I'm a member of the Socialist Workers Party and I've been helping to organize Marxism Festival this year. And I think I can hear how excited everyone is to be here. I think I'm going to call it and say that Marxism is going to be the best festival that everyone attends this summer. <laughs> I mean, I think it, it may not be Glastonbury, but we've got a great lineup of speakers. And we've got some great culture and we certainly won't be axing Jeremy Corbyn from the program. <laughs> Exciting time as well, where we're seeing massive resistance and loads of strikes. But I think it also comes a really crucial time where we're seeing a, a time of, of crisis. Um, and Marxism Festival is really going to be a space for us to all come together and discuss all of this over the next three days. We've got a brilliant um, program of meetings, workshops and panels. And we can really discuss how, uh, you know, the politics and how to fight for a better world. And... <laughs> off and all of that we've got an absolutely brilliant lineup of speakers for our opening rally tonight so to start us off um we've got sophia from saint mungo's now saint mungo's workers who aren't aware are charity workers in unite who have been uh, on strike for over four weeks now <laughs> Now, never mind for four weeks. Now, St. Mungo's workers are uh, into their all out indefinite strike. I'm really happy to welcome all the St. we have with us today, and I'd like to invite them up to the stage to join Sophia to speak. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, welcome, everyone, and thanks for showing us all your support for our course. My name is Sofia. I am from the outreach team in Sadok from Semangos. For those who don't know, Semangos is a charity. We work with homeless people, and we try to help them to rebuild their life and eventually, if possible, find the right housing solution. Um, we, the frontline workers, are the essential workers, and um, we support vulnerable people to achieve um, their dignity. But my question is, how can we do that if we're not, if we cannot achieve our dignity by not being paid enough? Um, <laughs> so, to be more specific. Um, I would say that our senior management and CEO got an increase in their salaries in their last 10 years. Uh, as an example, our CEO got a 77% rise in their uh, pay uh, in the last years. 
um, contrary to us, that we got a 30% less in real terms in our pay. Um, as we're all aware, uh, the inflation is going up um, everywhere, and um, UK is not an exception. This means that everyone will need to uh, spend more money to buy the same things. And specifically for workers, it will mean that we will need higher salaries to buy the same things and to fulfill our basic needs, which are rent and food and health and education and anything that is needed. Um, so indirectly, I already sum up our dispute because our dispute comes from our legitimate need to ask uh, and to have, uh, to obtain a 10% increase in our salaries. Um, yeah, which is uh, what we're fighting for, uh, to keep up with the inflation that is constantly rising up. Unfortunately, we have been offered a 1.75% before our strike, um, which we refused. <laughs> yeah, yay. <laughs> we refused and we decided to go on strike for four weeks in a row. But <laughs> we decided to make it indefinite uh, following some unconstructive meetings with our CEO and senior management. Um, we feel that going back to work for a charity whose main objective is to, to support those vic the main victims uh, in our society, in our modern society, uh, but they cannot even take the necessary steps to actually protect their own staff from themselves being vulnerable, it is against our work ethics, and it should also be against the ethics of those managing our charity. Um, according to Shelter Charity, which is another charity working with homeless people, half of people renting privately are one paycheck away from homelessness. And if we won't achieve and we won't reach uh, the right pay rise, uh, most of our staff might be in this halt. Okay. Uh, <laughs> then uh, we feel that voting indefinite strike was a big decision because I can assure that all of us want to go back to our work. Uh, but at this point with agency legally uh, covering our, our shifts when we are on strike, which is anti-democratic and anti-strike, uh, the only thing we could do is depriving them from our skills and so that they could really feel how essential we are. Senior manager management attitude has been disruptive and they haven't shown any genuine willingness to solve the dispute apart from trying to divide us and making us hopeless. But we will continue to stand and fight back because the workers united will never be defeated. The United will never be defeated. The workers united will never be defeated. Thank you everyone and enjoy the rest of the festival and thank you all for supporting us and keep up the fight. Yeah, a massive thank you to Sophia for that. And obviously massive solidarity to all the St. Mungo's workers. Um, I just wanted to say as well, that we're inviting everyone to go to the St. Mungo's workers picket line tomorrow. Um, there's one that's at 83 Endell Street and it's only 10 minutes away from SOAS, which is where we're holding Marxism Festival. Obviously your solidarity would be really great and it would be great to kick off the festival by going to a picket line. 
Uh, they'll be there from half seven to half nine in the morning, and they're asking to bring your union banners and your flags and all of that. Um, but also, <laughs> strikes. I'm really happy to announce our next speaker, who is Darren, who is a striker at Amazon. And well, <laughs> he's, sorry, Darren, he's part of the GMB members who have unionized and gone on strike for the first time. And we've seen really militant and great picket lines from all of those workers. So welcome, Darren. Just one word springs to mind is, is wow. Um, thank you so much for inviting me down here. Um, I haven't been with the SWP for very long. Uh, that man there, Richard Milner, got me involved. Um, and I, I, I can't say thank you enough. Um, as GMB, because obviously I, I want to start a movement today, hopefully. I didn't, I didn't think there would be that, this many people here. I asked GMB for some leaflets I could pass around. They gave me 15. So. Um, if you can share it right amongst every 200. I just want to share some numbers with you before, before I get into the, the real detail. Um, and, and, and this was from today. I, I, it blows my mind. 1.32 trillion, and that's trillion with a T. That's how much Amazon's net worth is today. So can someone please explain to me why over the last few years, the British government has given Amazon 700 million pounds. We know it's not a tax refund, do we? So why? They're telling us there's no, there's no money for nurses, doctors, postal workers, anything. 700 million. We walked out on the 5th of August last year, wildcat strike, and we just went for it. We'd worked two years through the pandemic. We'd seen how much money Amazon had made. Fair play. If they want to earn that much money, that's okay. But when you're not giving anyone anything back, it's disgusting. They told us we could have 50 pence extra. The amount of money they'd made through the pandemic was insane. I questioned it, and I was told perhaps you should have bought some shares. It was that point we went and sat down in the canteen and we sat there for five hours and we wouldn't move. Go back to work or we'll clock you out. Do what you got to do. Do what you got to do. They clocked us out. Some people went back to work because they were a bit scared because we obviously we didn't have any sort of union behind us. I gathered up enough people to walk out the next day and I said to them, I said, Come and meet me at Lady Godiva statue. It will be symbolic. But because of the diversity in the building, no one knew who Lady Godiva was. So I said, Omar, and everyone's like, be there. And we met there. And luckily, luckily, GMB were there. And they started signing people up. They said, can we talk to people? I said, please do, because I don't know what I'm doing. I don't. I don't. We signed up an extra 100 people that day. We'd only started with 30 in the building. We'd only started with 30 people, perhaps 50 in the building. But we grew and grew and grew. And when we walked out officially, that first strike on January 25th, we'd gone from being one in 50 in that building to one in five. So the demand was there. And as it stood on our last day of action, I can't remember the days now because it just all blends into one, but we became the majority in that building. We had 700 members. And since then, we've grown to 900. So, with the majority, we put the letter of recognition in. 
it's great. Amazon bosses invite us up. We all start colouring in colouring books. We're sharing donuts. It's great. No, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. They hired 1,300 people into that facility, into that facility. They doubled the workforce overnight. And when I say overnight, I mean overnight. This wasn't a steady trickle. They flooded that building. And there's plans to flood it more. So we've withdrawn our recognition. But you know what? We're going to keep going. We've signed up some of the new starters already. And I'll carry on. And I'll just tell you a little story. Richard took me under his wing when all this first started. And we were talking about when he was unionising a long time ago. And he said, some of his colleagues said to him, you'll never sign up 100% of the workforce. I'll tell you now, I'm going to try. I am trying so hard. I'll settle for 99. Okay, I've got to talk really, really quick now. I've... <laughs> I've been given zero hours this week. Amazon don't want me in the building. That's fine. That's probably because I called most of the managers Nazis. And that's okay. I know they're union busting. I know they're union busting. But what they've done at Rugeley, which is just up the road for us, is disgusting. They've started balloting to take action. So what have Amazon done? They're closing that fulfillment centre down. They're closing it down. They didn't even talk to the workforce first. They told the press these people were going into work and hearing and seeing on Twitter that their jobs were gone. The jobs are gone. So I'm asking you all today, and I'll be really, really quick, I promise. Who here has got Prime? Don't be shy. I'm not going to, it's not a finger pointing exercise. Do me a favor for January, uh, sorry, for July. Cancel it. Cancel it. You don't need that the next day. You don't. You can nip up to your local shop and get it. You don't need it. And do me a favour. We're out on the 11th, 12th and 13th, which is prime. Do me a favour. I've got some QR codes here. If you're that desperate to lose some money, donate it to us. I'm only asking for the fiver. Just do it on the 11th. Don't give it to Jeff. Share it with us because we really need it. This is one hell of a fight. It really is. And I appreciate being invited down. And I'll come down to London again. My, tax, my council tax actually comes to Euston now. I'm down here that often. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for your support. Thanks so much, Darren. I just wanted to draw everyone's attention to another special guest that we have at Marxism Festival, and that's Bookmark Socialist Bookshop. Uh, they'll, be selling, they'll be selling books throughout the event, so please go and check them out. They'll be set up in Senate House and they'll have stalls uh, around the venue. And, you know, I think it's right to say you shouldn't, be, you shouldn't be buying books from Amazon, you should be buying them from a shop that matters. <laughs> Okay, um, now I'm really honoured to invite our next speaker, Marcia Rigg. Now, Marcia Rigg really wanted to be with us here in the room today, uh, but she's going to be joining us on Zoom. Um, Marcia's brother, Sean Rigg, died in police custody in 2008, and ever since then, she's been an absolutely fearless fighter for justice and an inspiration to us all. Welcome, Marcia. Thank you very much. I hope everybody can hear me. Hi everybody, I'm so sorry that I can't actually be with you in person today. Um, I'm actually attending a funeral, but I've taken some time out to address you beautiful people here tonight. Um, as you all know, um, I'm the sister of Sean Rigg, who died um, in August 2008. And this year makes it 15 years since my brother died. And that is, that is, and it is extraordinary because during those 15 years, I've met so many families 
whose loved ones have died at the hands of the state, be it by police officers or in prisons or mental health settings. And what I've learned over those 15 years is there is no justice. There is just us. And that doesn't mean that we must not um, continue the struggle. It doesn't mean that we must give up. It means that we must cling on to hope for our future generations. It's really, really important. And that we must never, ever give up. We're living in a climate where police officers are racist, misogynistic, rapists, murderers, and nobody has ever been made accountable. The first time we really saw somebody go to prison for the, a full life sentence was when Sarah Everard was murdered. And that was absolutely the right thing to do. And somebody for the first time went for a whole life sentence. But there's so many other injustices. We have um, Joy Gardner, 30 years since Joy Gardner died and we still have no joy. We still have no justice. And um, we've had numerous reviews over the decades. We've had the McPherson review, whereas recently in the news just this week, we see failures by the Metropolitan Police where a sixth murderer um, was involved. The sixth person was involved in the death of Stephen Lawrence. And that person has now died. But it just shows that, you know, the absolute failures of the Metropolitan Police and that family Doreen Lawrence or Neville, Neville Lawrence have not given up. Since 1990, there have been over 1,860 mm -hmm. odd plus deaths in custody. And we've given numerous evidence to um, reviews and reports and, and hundreds and thousands of recommendations have been made over the decades, over at least a 40 year span, uh, of which very um, few of those recommendations have actually been um, been put into place. And so we continue to fight all these years later. In the meantime, families are traumatized indefinitely. Families are, you know, their well-being is, uh, is affected because of these deaths. And, you know, I will tell you more when I come on Saturday, I'll be speaking at SOAS. But I'd just like to say as well that I've just learned in my brother's case, the Sean Reed case, last month I learned that three of the officers that was involved in the death of my brother and killed him, the IOPC found it fit to pay them compensation. Did you all hear me right? The three officers in my brother's case received this year in 2023 um, compensation to the tune of £65,000 between three officers where the IOPC paid them that because of the length of the, um, the case. The case went on for, for 10 and a half years uh, where they walked free following a misconduct hearing. So now the issue is compensation is being paid by the IOPC for the very same reason that families have been using a beating stick uh, about them where they have not been, we cannot depend on them. They are not independent. They, they, they have ex-police officers working within the IOPC. And now we find out that officers are claiming compensation. This is a public scandal. This is a, a matter of the great serious public interest and I look forward to meeting you all again on Saturday so we can discuss these issues because where there is no justice there will never be any peace no justice no peace thank you for listening I can't hear the audience clapping, but I can see you. I love you all and take care.
Thank you so much, Marcia. Now, I just want to announce that Marxism Festival 2023 is the biggest Marxism festival in over a decade. Now, this means that it's going to be big and it is going to be busy. And I'm sure people that have been at the event today have experienced that. So what we're saying is please be patient with us. But to ensure you get to all the meetings you want to, get to the rooms early. Also, if you've got any questions throughout the event, please speak to the lovely people in pink t-shirts and they'll be able to help you out. Okay, so I wanna welcome our next speaker who is Amar Anwar and he needs no introduction, but Amar Anwar is a leading human rights lawyer and he's been acting for the last eight years um, as the lawyer for the family of Sheku Bayo, who was another black man who died in police custody. He's also just fresh out of the UK COVID inquiry where he's questioned Scotland's former first minister. Um, you know, and on a personal level, he won a civil action against the police for a racist attack after they smashed his front teeth out in 1991 when he was a member of the Socialist Workers Student Society, which spurred him on to become a lawyer. So welcome, Amar. Thank you, comrades. It's nice to be back. Um, as was just said, I've just been um, the last several weeks in the UK COVID inquiry this, this morning. This afternoon, I was questioning Nicola Sturgeon, our former first minister. And only um, at the start of the, the COVID inquiry, I had to sit probably 15 metres away from David Cameron, um, from George Osborne, from Jeremy Hunt. Managed to miss Matt Hancock on Tuesday because I was up in Edinburgh. Um, but... When you look at what each and every single minister, former minister, former prime minister has come to that inquiry and said, the reality is the United Kingdom wasn't prepared. The capacity of the United Kingdom to cope with COVID was diminished by years of underfunding, by years of cuts, by the impact of Brexit. What we now know, Operation Yellowhammer, which each civil servant, the World Health Organization, senior civil servants, doctors, chief medical officers coming in and saying, that because of the no deal Brexit that they were preparing for, resources were diverted from fighting a pandemic, a tier one pandemic, where they said potentially 800,000 people could die. So all of a sudden, all resources shifted to fighting that. And each one of those 227,000 people who died from COVID in this country, each one of those deaths not only represents an individual tragedy, but has affected the friends, the family, the loved ones of each one of those who dies as our leaders. And I say, when I say leaders, it doesn't just start with Boris Johnson because the accusations, the allegations we made on David Cameron and George Osborne was that it started with them, with their attacks, with their austerity. They brought the NHS to its knees. And it's our leaders who stand accused of presiding over a carousel of chaos. Those who lost loved ones will no longer be invisible in their misery. They were told they will be front and center of these COVID inquiries. And it's for this inquiry to illuminate the truth. And over the coming months and the coming years, there may be times that this inquiry will falter. I, for one, do not give a damn if the Daily Telegraph has Matt Hancock's WhatsApps, because I know exactly which angle the Daily Telegraph and the Daily Mail is coming for. It's in that inquiry. It's in the courtrooms that Boris Johnson should appear. It's in the courtrooms that Matt Hancock should give his evidence and along with every single one of those Tory hypocrites. And we said at the start of this inquiry in our submissions to Lady Hallett that this inquiry must never be afraid to raise its voice for the truth. That is the very least we owe to those who lost their lives and to those in the future who will have to fight what we know is a... a is likely to happen another pandemic and as for those Tory hypocrites every single one of them came and sat down and turned to the right to the family members of COVID bereaved who sat in the public galleries and said their empty words of sorrow these are the same hypocrites who asked us to stand on our doorsteps clapping the frontline workers as they cried out for PPE as they cried out for equipment that would save their lives as they died saving lives and no person no institution, no matter how powerful, whether they be in England, Wales, Northern Ireland or Scotland, 
whether they be in Westminster or Holyrood, should be allowed to obstruct this search for the truth. Now, I mentioned on Tuesday was I was actually back in Edinburgh, took a break from the COVID inquiry. It was because we were making legal submissions on the first phase of the Sheku Bayo inquiry. And I'm back again today to ask your support for the family of Sheku Bayo, who died in police custody in May 2015. He's been described by Sheku's sister as Scotland's George Floyd, and I never knew Sheku Bayo. He wasn't a rich a powerful man, he had a stubborn family, he has three sisters, he has a mother, a partner, Colette, who have refused, rather like Marsha Rigg, rather like every single family that has spoken in the 35 odd years that have on and off that have come to Marxism, each family who've come, who've raised their heads, who in the midst of their grief have been forced to set up campaigns and have refused to be patronized, they've refused to be bullied, they've refused to be lied to and they've refused to be silenced. Because they, the Bayo family, like Marsha's family, like every other family before them, are not asking for anything special. Just the truth. Because they know without truth, there can be no justice. And as for Sheku, he was 31 years old. He was a trainee gas engineer. He was a father of two young boys. He was popular. He was healthy. He had no previous history or violence or convictions. And he'd moved, to Lon moved from London at the age of 11. He moved to London at the age of 11 from Sierra Leone. And then he moved to the town of Kokodi at 17 because his sister thought it would be safer for a young black man to grow up in the town of Kokodi. When one Sunday on the 3rd of May 2015 at 7.15 a.m., nine police officers, six vehicles responded to an alert following calls from members of the public that a black man was walking down the street with a knife acting erratically. Sheku was under the influence of drugs. He was going through a mental health crisis. He had taken a bad reaction and the four police officers reached there first. How did they deal with it? On his death, they painted an image of a large black man, stereotypical characteristics, describing him with extraordinary strength, describing him as the biggest black, biggest male they had ever seen, bulging eyes, muscles, wielding a machete, describing as a zombie who was not reacting to their screaming of this. This, of course, is nothing new. Because when black men die in police custody in this country, whether it be in this country, whether it be in France, whether it be in the United States, they are dehumanized, they are smeared, they are stereotyped in order to strip them of their right to life. But Sheku wasn't the biggest male that they had ever seen. He was five foot, 10 inches and weighed 12 stone, 10 pounds, 80 kilos. The first two officers who dealt with him, one was 17 stones. The other was 25 stones. They were both six foot, four inches. We now know that the total weight on Sheku Bayo's body restraining. You saw George Floyd, one police officer, six police officers on Sheku Bayo with a total combined weight of over 546 kilograms, over half a ton of weight restraining him. We now know that Sheku Bayo had no machete. He had no knife. He was unarmed. He was open walking open-handed in the days when the police arrived and the first officer immediately jumped out of the van and fired CS spray at him. Sheku just carried on walking. The second officer then fired Pava spray at him. Sheku just carried on walking. The third officer then tried to use his baton on him. Sheku again just carried on walking in a mental health crisis. No violence, no aggression, but they said they were terrified for their lives from him. And then the fourth officer who released a baton and said she was terrified for her life. When we checked the statements, we found that Sheku Bayo had his back to her and was walking away. And it's at that point that he turned around and tried to run and he's supposed to punch the police officer in the back of the head. But within 45 seconds, of the police first arriving, Sheku Bayo was face down on the ground, losing consciousness, struggling for his last breath. The restraining officers restrained him. They applied handcuffs. They put on leg restraints. They put on ankle restraints. And he'd been batting to the head at least twice. And when Sheku's lifeless body arrived at the hospital, he was still handcuffed with leg restraints still in place. And his sister, Caddy, described him as shackled like a slave until the hawk doctor said, remove the restraints, remove the handcuffs on this man who had stopped breathing. And reports were released in the minutes after Sheku lost consciousness of a policewoman having been stabbed, which several hours later, of course, the police had to correct as being untrue. You remember John Charles de Menzies? Remember the padded jacket? Remember the jumping over the ticket barrier? Remember not giving in to the, the police response to stop? And ultimately, seven years later, because it's always seven years, it's always eight years later that the families managed to get some form of a hearing, we found out that none of that was true. None of it was true. And with hours of his death, they told Colette, Sheku's partner, that Sheku was found dead on a public street by a member of the public who called an ambulance, but he later died on the street. Nine of those officers, 
returned back to the police station and were placed together in the same room for some eight hours. In 23 years of being a lawyer, I've been involved, and I know that when I've had young men who've been involved in a gang or been arrested together, never once has the police taken them to the station and put them in a room together for eight hours so they can discuss their defense. They were always taken separately. They're paid into separate cells or detention rooms, and then they are questioned. The police officers then refused to provide statements for 32 days, and the family were forced. The family were forced to begin their campaign for justice. And four years after Sheku's death, the family were betrayed by that justice system in 2018 and told no officers would face charges, not a single charge. Sheku's body was covered with 24 separate injuries, bruises, cuts, lacerations, and a broken rib. No charges of murder, no culpable homicide, no serious assault, no assault, no attempt to pervert the course of justice, no charge of a health and safety prosecution. And the family said, did they really think that Sheku's life was so cheap that his family would walk away and his family campaigned for a public inquiry? And that inquiry began a year ago. And what they have said is, whether it be the United States, whether it be Scotland or England, why is it that a black man is always held responsible for his own death in police custody. Caddy's sister said, Sheku Scotland's George Floyd. The only difference is that in the United States, five days of protests led to four officers facing a trial. In Scotland, five years of trusting the justice system gave him betrayal and lies. Two, and several, two, three years ago, millions marched for George Floyd. Everyone from pop stars, footballers, government ministers took the knee, people put up the hashtag Black Lives Matter, and believe, I mean, don't blame me for being cynical or being angry because two, two, three years later, I don't see black lives matter anywhere. I don't see, I don't see the fact, I see the fact that black people are still dying in police custody. And that spirit is still there. The anger is still there. We saw it three years ago when we, three, three or, sorry, I lose count whether it's three or two because it seems like yesterday all the time. But when we forced the release of the immigration detainees from Priti Patel's home office van in Kemyo Street. Um, and that anger, that anger exists. Anger exists, and I remember when I opened the police door, when the police opened the door to the detention van, and I spoke to the two Indian men, and I said, you're free. You're free because of the power of the people, the power of the people of Glasgow. And we saw that same spirit exploding in Edinburgh, then in Peckham, and if black lives still matter, then stand up for the family of Shikubayo. No family should ever have to go through the burden of losing a loved one in police custody, and then find the legal system fails them. Families shouldn't have to rely on their own efforts to make sure the full facts are established. We've always had to fight for freedom and justice. And I want to finish off. So the one minute, I always take the piss. Um, I want to say a few words about today's decision, the Court of Appeal. And I want to say a few words, not about the billionaires that died in the Titanic. Any loss of life, as I've continuously been told, is, is, is sad. I want to talk about the several hundred who died in the Mediterranean. Um, and today, the Court of Appeal found that Cruella Braverman's plan to send asylum seekers to Rwanda is unlawful. And believe me, I don't trust any court when it comes down to it. They will be back for it. They will go to the Supreme Court and they will keep trying, they will keep trying. But offshoring people 5,000 miles away in a grubby cash for people, what can I say, crash for people plan, what can I say, in the, you know, is, is a case of it's cowardly, it's barbaric. It's inhumane, it's modern day slavery, when you want to treat people who are fleeing persecution and war, and it's part of the bigger Tory plan to scapegoat people for the government's failures. Refugees fleeing war, fleeing poverty, persecution and disasters are not a drain on the resources of Britain. It's not down. down to a people in despair from across the world that council housing benefits and this nhs treatment are unavailable this is all thanks to years of tory austerity i remember the words of cameron i remember the words of george osborne a few weeks ago when we asked them the questions about austerity and its impact on inequality and its, its impact on the death rate that took place in this country and their words was i don't agree with that you don't see that picture pensioners were better off the poor were better off, the vulnerable were better off. And I do not know And somebody, one of my lawyers turned around to me and says, I said, they don't care. They are psychopaths. They kill people in this country with their policy and they lie and lie through their teeth. And it suits, it suits those at the top to pump out myths that migrants in boats are the problem rather than the rich in their super yachts. And the number of billionaires has risen and risen to new record highs. The super rich, the super rich should be the target in this country. 
for workers' anger and action, not refugees. And if there were safe and legal routes for refugees like there were for Ukrainians, they wouldn't be forced into the arms of traffickers, locking the borders, deporting people who will only increase the reliant on smugglers. Sorry about conscious time. All I want to say is that keep raising your voice for the truth because there are families across the country who have no voice and their loved ones are gone and the dead cannot cry out for justice. It is the duty of the living to do so. And many of the people in this room are the memory of our working class, of all the struggles that have taken place for generations. So thank you. Thank you so much, Amar. That was really powerful. And absolutely, justice for Sheku Bayo, justice for Sean Rigg, Black Lives Matter and refugees are welcome here. Now, I'm really happy to announce our next speaker, which is Jess Edwards. Uh, she's got a hard act to follow, but I trust she can do it. Um, Jess is a striker in the National Education Union, and we're really happy to see that they've announced strikes again next week. <laughs> uh, so please welcome Jess, a teacher in Lambeth, a member of the National Executive of the NEU and a member of the Socialist Workers' Party. I really wish I'd gone first because <laughs> how do you follow such an amazing uh, lineup? So bear with me because my talk is not going to be at all inspirational. <laughs> Uh, um, so yeah, my name's Jess, I'm a teacher and I am on strike next week, very proud to be uh, striking to stand up for our rights and for the rights right to the children um, in our schools. And we hear lots about the cost of living crisis, don't we? The huge gap that is now opening in our society between those who have money and those who don't, the super wealthy and now the growing super poor. And the fact that we hear a lot about um, have the squeeze on workers' living standards. It's a squeeze that is the biggest squeeze since the Napoleonic Wars. And of course, our strike in the NEU, just like St Mungo's, just like the BMA strikes, the rail, wherever they might take place, is absolutely about our pay. And we make no, uh, we're not embarrassed at all to stand up and say that we deserve a fair wage for the work that we do. Sometimes that gets lost because it is about more than that as well. And I'm going to talk about that as well. But I think it's important to start with it. We are right to fight for what we deserve. Uh, but our strikes are about even more, much more fundamental things, um, I think, than pay. They're about what kind of a society we want to live in. They're about what kind of an education system do we want our kids to have? What kind of a health service do we want our sick are poor, are vulnerable to be treated um, under. They're about fundamental questions about society and about the world in which we live. They're about whether we have a society that is run in the interests of profit and greed, with climate instability, with climate chaos, with a threat to the very existence of the human race, or whether we have something that is about social justice, something where our poor and our sick are treated with, oh my God, um, with, with, with dignity, where cooperation and collaboration um, are important. And I want us to say a little bit about what it is to work in schools at the moment, a very little bit, because um, I've got one minute. Um, but actually, it can be quite is that our kids used to have be cut to the bone, to be scrapped, to be got rid of. But we still see those kids every day in our schools picking up the pieces where children that are in need of EHCP plans can't have them because they're not need related anymore, they're budget related or because your school has met the secret quota that nobody talks about but everybody knows still exists. The world in our schools is the one where social services so overstretched are not able to meet the needs 
of the children, where children are suffering in a way that I have not seen in my 20 years of being a primary school teacher um, in South London, a mental health crisis that is worse than we have ever seen in our schools. And you can get, forget about mental health services for children unless a child is suicidal and at immediate risk, you will not see CAMS in your school. And the message to us is you deal with it. This is your problem. Your kids can't achieve, it's your fault. Um, the arbitrary targets that are set. Why can't you do it? You're the problem. It is you. Amanda Spielman, the Chief Inspector of Ofsted, who said that we spent too much time in the pandemic feeding children rather than teaching them. But nobody told her that hungry kids are not able to learn. Before I move on to the most important part of my speech, I wanted to say we're fighting a culture war, um, aren't we? Because they're fighting for the culture that they want in our schools. So Catherine Burble Singh at the National Conservatism Conference, she said this, she said, do you love your country enough to send your kids to a less woke school despite being an outcast at the dinner party? She said, if we don't get on top of the culture that these schools are propagating, we'll lose our country. She's talking about people like us, people who stand for social justice, people who stand against racism and sexism and bigotry, and that want to see children that we teach reflected in the curriculum in our school and decently cared for. So yes, we are really angry because the top 10% of earners have just um, got more, a bigger pay rise than they have ever had since 2008. How can it be that the mega rich continue to rake in getting richer and richer while the rest of us get poorer? So the St. Mungo's work, workers on strike for pay because they're defending their service, the homeless people, the most vulnerable in our society, the nurses and the doctors on strike for their pay, defending the NHS, defending the sick, defending the elderly, trains for a decent train service that we haven't had in this country for quite a long time. I went to Manchester the other day and you couldn't even get there. You had to go via, uh, via Leeds. People that are trying to fight for distant, for, for, for desperately needed services. And this struggle is throwing up questions and that's what Marxism Festival is all about. It's about talking about the questions of organisation, of our trade unions, of rank and file organisation, of race and sex and disability and sexuality and gender, and all of it, of course, um, talking about the question of class. And that's what we want this event to be about. We want it to be a space for the whole movement to come together to debate and discuss those key things that are facing our movement. How do we win? How do we fundamentally reorder society so that it works in our interests and not in the interests of the rich and the wealthy? And uh, to do that, here it comes, costs money. And um, so there's gonna be a collection. <laughs> that was the money speech. Um, <laughs> there's buckets coming round. But we don't want any noise in the bucket, so it has to be paper money, preferably 50s, if you've got them. Um, and also, there are card readers outside. Um, so hopefully, the buckets won't be full, but the card readers are going to be pinging, pinging, pinging. Um, half of the money is going to go to the Marxism Festival, but fest festival, um, and the other half is going to the St. Mungo Strikers to make sure that their fight wins. So dig deep. Thanks so much, Jess. Um, and I just wanted to say a few things. So after the opening rally, we're all going to be going to Mully's Bar to continue the discussion and the debate. Uh, you know, have a drink, have a chat. Um, Mully's Bar is just a two-minute walk away, so don't run off. Um, and there's student prices, so it's cheap. And we've got a minimum spend to hit, so please come and help us out. <laughs> Jess is also the organizer of the Workers' Summit. So, <laughs> uh, and it's gonna be a really, really crucial event for, um, for our movement to come together to discuss all of these questions that Jess was talking about that have been thrown up. 
you know, and to discuss really where, where is next for the movement and where is next for the strikes and, and also how do we actually win those strikes. Uh, you know, the theme of the Workers' Summit is link the fights, reject bad deals and fight to win. So I'd urge everyone to get there and get your unions affiliated and so on. Now, finally, still while the buckets are going around, um, Marxism Festival 2023 is hosted by the Socialist Workers' Party. Now we've got a really, uh, we've got a membership team who uh, are running about the event as well. And uh, they've got the red forms. And if, you're, if you like what you've heard today, if you like what you've heard in the opening rally and over the weekend, uh, we, I'd really urge you to join or at least have a chat with, those membership, with that membership team, go up to their stalls and get involved because really the time is now. Um, <laughs> Okay, so now I'm really, really excited to announce our next speaker who has traveled all the way from New York. Um, <laughs> he was gonna manage to get here because there was lots of cancellations, but alas, it was meant to be. Um, Chris Moores uh, helped to it's a historic victory in the US where he unionized the first Amazon workplace. Uh, and since then, he's gone around America campaigning and unionizing, helping to unionize other workplaces. And we're really, really excited to have him here today. So a big welcome to Chris Smalls. Energy going. I need that energy. Um, love you too. Uh, do me a favor, y'all. I want the energy again. Stand, stand up. Now look to your left and look to your right and say, I got your back. 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 One more time. I got your back. I got your back. Now y'all can be seated. I wouldn't be a good organizer too if I didn't come with my QR codes. <laughs> so I have some for y'all. Um, we're a grassroots organization, uh, Amazon Labor Union, the first union in American history, represent 8,300 members in Staten Island, New York. Darren, we beat, we beat GMB. We got, I got about 30 QR codes instead of 15. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> let's talk about uh, what we really got to talk about. Um, it's a revolution. <laughs> see, when, I, when I look around the room, I see the people that represent different movements whether it's social injustice, whether it's environmental, whether it's women's rights, trans rights, Palestinian, refugees, teachers, doctors, nurses, Amazon workers. We all in the room right now, right? Students, we all here. We're the community. So when they say show you what the community look like, look around the room, because this is what community looks like. Darren had mentioned uh, 
you know, I cost, I cost Amazon $4 billion. <laughs> Look at that, you get, you get fired three years ago, you end up at a Marxism festival, you never know. If you'd have asked me, I'd be standing here three years ago. I'd have looked at you like you was fucking crazy. Yeah. But you know what? The times that we're living in now, you know, uh, the pandemic, what it did to us, a lot of us, including myself, it changed our lives forever. When we're talking about going back to normal, you know, <laughs> what was normal? You know, what was that before the pandemic? And when I think about it, and when we all think about it, being deemed as essential workers by the government and the corporations. Remember, we didn't give ourselves these titles. You know, all the titles and all the stigmas that they give to the working class people, it never comes from the working class people. Seems to always come from somebody who makes decisions for the rest of us. We're low skilled workers. We're underpaid. We don't deserve to be making you know, 20, 30 pounds an hour. You know, we are essential workers though. We're the closest thing to the Red Cross during the pandemic. <laughs> but when it comes time to pay us what we rightfully deserve or to negotiate a contract, negotiate our hours, they don't want to do that. They want to continue exploiting us, exploiting our labor to fatten up the CEO's pockets and the corporations and the government who's fueling this. But what we are seeing now in the times that we're in, these strikes, the uprising of labor, our historical victory last year, you're seeing workers of the working class say no more. We're not taking no more. We're standing up and we're fighting back for what we deserve. And what we're standing at, what we're standing up for right now it's bigger than us, it's bigger than ourselves. We may not be able to see the full picture. I know I haven't. And when people ask me, you know, once again, three years ago, I tell my story all the time because it's important. I wasn't an organizer, wasn't an organizer for a union, uh, wasn't trying to, you know, uh, form a union at Amazon. I was a supervisor there for four and a half years. I opened up three buildings for them. Um, I was a model employee. I trained thousands of Amazon employees in the, in the States. I trained hundreds of upper management. I thought the company had my best interests in my own personal career growth. It wasn't until the pandemic, unfortunately, four and a half years into my tenure that I found out that that was all a lie. Amazon's ran off of numbers, metrics, robots, machinery, but one thing they don't calculate and they never have is love and solidarity. That's something that they can never figure out. So when they, fix, when they ask us, when they, when they ask myself and my organizers, how was you able to defeat this? I didn't, yeah, today, they're $1.3 trillion. It's always been that way. When they ask us, how are we able to defeat this trillion dollar company? It's simple. Love and solidarity is free. And what we have proven today with the Marxism Festival kickoff, it's free, y'all showed up. That's what we have to do for each other. Darren has proven that with the COVID tree workers up, in the, up there, that he showed up and he showed them that they, he cares for them. He shows them every day when he goes in, when they do put you on schedule. Um, he's showing the workers there that I'm here for you. I may not have a pocket full of money like Jeff Bezos, but love and caring, having a shoulder to lean on, having se several conversations, because organizing is not just one, it's several conversations. Being there for the most vulnerable people in a time of need, that's something that Amazon and any corporation, no matter what industry you're in, that's something they can never figure out. The power of people. 
the amount of money is unmatched. No amount of money in the world can amount to the power of people when we come together. So take it from me, I'm Jeff Bezos, arch nemesis, number one. Right? They like that one. Jeff Bezos during the pandemic made $13 billion a day, $9 million an hour, almost $5,000 a second. So in this little bit of a speech that I gave today, he made a couple million dollars. Just think about that. While we sit here and have our meetings and our festival and our strikes and have our get togethers, this man is making millions by the hour off of our backs. Off of our backs. Government giving them tax rebates. That's your, that's your money. So when we say that this is a revolution, this is absolutely a revolution. This is everybody's fight. It's not just the Amazon workers of Cobra Tree. It's not just the ALU in Staten Island. This is everybody's fight. Understand that. Well, of course, we know that Amazon's an anti-union company, and, and they in the right country in America, where they're all over the place, in every major city and beyond. You know, if we don't realize that in the next few years, one out of every four people will either work or have work at Amazon. That's how, that's how much they're hiring and firing and exploiting the working class people. That in the next few years, you're gonna either know somebody who worked there, if not yourself, will be working at an Amazon facility. So if this is not your fight, I don't know what else is. If you're a prime user right now, as Darren mentioned, as a guilty conscience, um, not only order your product, cancel your prime though, I do agree with that. But when you do order your product, send $5 or five pounds to one of our unions that is fighting against Amazon. Do that so you can help us out, you know? And, and understand, we're fighting for our children. You know, I have, I have twins, uh, two beautiful twins, one boy, one girl. They're 10 years old. I know it don't look like I'm a dad, but <laughs> they, they told me I'm pretty cool sometimes. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes. I mean, single dad, and I'm, you know, uh, I'm fighting for them. Every time, you know, I was with them yesterday before I flew out here. But every time I, you know, I do these events and, um, you know, continue to travel across the world now, you know, London, y'all love me. I've been here three times now. Thank you. Love y'all. Damn. No, I'm serious. Yeah, clap it up for y'all because y'all really, <laughs> I'm doing something right over here. Um, but when I think about, you know, what I'm fighting for and I have to remind myself because we all have to remind ourselves as organizers, you know, this is not a, it's not an easy fight. It's not a, a quick turnaround. This is a long fight. And we gotta prepare ourselves mentally. And it's not meant for everybody. People check out every day. You know, we have to remind ourselves why we're here. And I remind myself uh, every day when I look at my kids, like I'm fighting so that they don't have to fight. And you're you're fighting so your children don't have to fight. So we gotta understand the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is there's no cavalry coming for us. There's nobody coming. The government, forget about it. Politicians, forget about it. You can elect progressives all you want. I got one minute? Cool. Um, we can elect the right people all you want. Breadcrumbs is all we've been getting for decades. Breadcrumbs, it's not enough. So we have to not only come together as people, we gotta remind the bosses, remind the people, remind the government, remind ourselves 
who really has the power? Right? Mind ourselves. That when we come together, like we are tonight, and we get to different spaces, think outside the box. When you leave here, this is a call to action. It's not just a Marxism festival. It's a call to action. When you leave here today, when you leave this festival, when you go back, that fire is lit. It's time we have these conversations in our community, at home. When we talk about a revolution, the revolution starts with yourself. Talk to your loved ones, your neighbors, your friends, your cousins, your brothers, your sisters, your aunts, your uncles, your, your mommy, daddy, anybody that don't know what you heard today. Share our messages, share our stories, share our struggles. Our fight is your fight. And this is, this is a revolution. This is. So one more time. I got your back. I got can amount to the power of people when we come together. Power to the people, y'all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. And out mass of solidarity to those fighting across the pond. And I think being Jeff Bezos' arch nemesis means you're definitely doing something right. <laughs> now, our final speaker tonight is Lewis Nielsen. And Lewis, we've got to give a big thank you to because he's, been all, he's the organizer of Marxism Festival this year. <laughs> Hey, welcome, Lewis. <laughs> Look, I want to thank every single one of the speakers that we've had tonight so far. Um, everyone who's spoken tonight is a fighter. And I think that one of the biggest testaments that we can pay to every struggle we've heard tonight is to recognize that it's not an individual fight. What we've heard tonight is about something much, much more. It's about what kind of society we want to live in. When you hear Chris and Darren talking about what's been going on at Amazon, it's not just about the extreme wealth of someone like Jeff Bezos, but it's about the way that ordinary people are treated in our society. Made to work harder, made to work longer, less pay, less rights at work, it's a common experience and it's across the board. And the same applies to what we heard from Amma and from Marcia tonight. Those cases of Shekubayo and Sean Rigg, they're not about individual cops. It's not about an individual case. It's about a whole police force, a whole institution. It's about the way it treats ordinary people and then they cover it up. Marcia said it, 1,800 deaths in police custody since 1990, not one police officer has been charged. And I think Chris said it right. That is part of the bigger picture. I think the bigger picture applies to a lot of the struggles that you see happening at the moment. It's not about just one strike. It's not about one campaign. It's not about one struggle for justice. It's about a system that is rigged for those at the top of society. Think about what we've seen with the cost of living crisis over the last few years. Think about the fact that in Britain, a record 2 million people are now on food banks. Think about what we saw last winter, warm banks, where public buildings have to open to keep pensioners warm because they can't afford to heat their homes. And at the same time, Shell and BP make record profits. Think about the report a few days ago. One in seven people in Britain suffer from malnutrition or hunger because they can't afford food with the rise of the cost of living. And what they tell us, is they say it's about an inflationary crisis that they can't control. They say that we're all feeling the pinch. 
Tell that to Rishi Sunak and his fortune of 700 million. Tell that to Emma Haddad, the boss of CEO and her six-figure salary. And tell it to Jeff Bezos, one of the richest men in the planet. And when they say that, what they're trying to do is they're trying to protect their profits. They're trying to make us pay while they get richer. And this has been happening for quite a long time now. First, it was austerity. Then it was the pandemic. Now it's inflation. And now they're saying that a recession is on the way. They're saying that they're worried about what's happening with the banks and that a recession is on the way. They're going to try and make us pay for it again. And all of that, I think, means that the strikes we've heard tonight, the strikes are so important because they tell us that we don't have to take that lying down. We don't have to just accept the way that things are. So I'm delighted that we kick off Marxism Festival with a panel of strikers tonight. And one of the big questions for us over the next four days, one of the big questions is not how we resolve the strikes, it's how we see more of them. It's not how the strikes settle. It's not how the strikes settle, it's how they win. And I tell you what, I'm so delighted we have St. Mungo's here tonight. To say that we're going all out, staying out till we win, that's something every trade union leader could learn from in Britain. So look, that's a big question for us to discuss at the festival over the next four days, but there are other questions as well. You can't have a discussion about how we beat them back on the cost of living crisis or how we win the strikes unless we have a discussion about how we take on their biggest weapon. And one of their biggest weapon at the moment is a question of divide and rule. The way in which they're using racism and Islamophobia in a way they haven't for decades. Gary Lineker's right to say it's a language of the 1930s. Look at what's happening around Europe. Look around Europe, look in Italy. A hundred years after Mussolini marches on Rome, a fascist is now prime minister of Italy in Giorgio Maloney. Look at France, where Marine Le Pen gets 41% of the vote. And look at Greece. Look at Greece, where 500 people are left to drown. And they say it's an accident. This wasn't an accident. This is state murder at the hands of Fortress Europe. And here in Britain, we face a dangerous project as well. Um, I tell you what, I'm delighted to see the back of Boris Johnson out of Parliament. To see an old Etonian kicked out on his ass, someone who thinks he was born to rule, good. But let's not pretend it makes this government any less nasty. Look at Suella Braverman, every day, stopping the boats, blaming refugees, blaming Albanians. So one of the big discussions we have to have over the next four days is how we beat back that, erasive, beat back that racist, racist offensive. And I tell you what, you don't beat racism by compromising with it. The way that you beat racism. The way you fight racism is you confront it. You say that there's no such thing as a good migrant or a bad migrant. It doesn't matter where you're from, whether it's Ukraine or Afghanistan, we have to say every single migrant and refugee is welcome here in Britain. But look, there are lots of other fights for us to think about as well over the next four days. Think about the case of Carla Foster. A woman here in Britain sentenced to 28 months in prison for having an abortion. There is a project from Poland to the US to roll back the gains that women have made. I don't think that Britain's immune. Jacob Rees-Mogg Jacob Rees might look like he comes from an oil painting from the Victorian age, but his views on women belong there as well. They are coming after every single gain we've ever made. And one of the big fights at the moment is LGBT plus rights. I don't know about you, but I am sick of it. Every day in the press, the politicians on TV, telling us that trans people are a threat, that LGBT plus rights have gone so far. And shockingly, some people on the left say there's a debate or they say they're not sure. We're clear, trans women are women, trans men are men, non-binary people deserve our solidarity.
The truth is, is that we face a government in Britain who are learning the lessons of the right across Europe. They are cohering around a hard right project. And that's why they're giving the police new powers. New powers to stop our right to protest, to stop our right to go on strike. You know a government's in trouble when to restore public confidence, they turn to the Metropolitan Police. <laughs> Think about what we've seen. Think about the police force in this country. Hillsborough, Stephen Lawrence, McPherson, Sarah Everard, David Carrick. Think about the news that came out this week. Another cover up in the Stephen Lawrence case, 30 years on. I was born a few months after Stephen Lawrence was killed. There were people in this room who said then that the police were institutionally racist and institutionally corrupt. Marcia Riggs said it. 30 years of reform, 30 years of training, 30 years of change has got us nowhere. Look at the Casey report. It's about time we talked about stop. We stopped talking about reforming the police. It's about time we called for their abolition. Look, it's important we take on these issues. It's important we take on these issues because we have to re resist every instance of divide and rule. If they divide us, our side is weaker. And we've got some big battles ahead of us. Think about the threat of climate change. Think about the record profits of BP and Shell, and they're the people heading us towards climate catastrophe and disaster. And the same is true for war. They tell people like Jess, they tell teachers, nurses, doctors that there's no money for a pay rise, but they've always got money for war, always got money for weapons. And they say it's about making the world a safer place. The reality is the world is more dangerous than we've known it in decades. We're on the brink of nuclear war. So look, we have to, we have to oppose what Putin's done in Ukraine, but we have to oppose the warmongers in NATO as well. That's why this weekend matters. That's why the Marxism Festival is important. I want to welcome everyone to it. It's been a great start today and tonight. If it's your first Marxism Festival, I hope you enjoy it. And if it's your 40th, I hope it's one of the best you've been to. This event is not an academic conference. This is an event to talk about how we change the world. And in that struggle, there's a couple of things for us to think about. We have to think about a couple of things. The first is to say this. All those crises that I just talked about, all the crises that we've heard from the stage tonight, those crises are linked. They didn't just fall from the sky. They're not an accident. And if that's true, then our struggles have to be linked. We can't just be anti-racist or climate activists or trade unionists. We have to be all those things, but we have to be the people who are linking up the struggles and linking up the dots. And to do that, we have to remember that our real power comes from below. Our power doesn't lie in Parliament. Our power doesn't lie with the Labour Party. It certainly doesn't lie with Sir Keir Starmer. But to be honest, our power didn't lie with Jeremy Corbyn in Labour. It didn't lie with Syriza in Greece or Podemos in, St in Spain or the projects that tried to tame the state. Our real power comes from below. Think about what we learned in the pandemic. What we learned in the pandemic is that the real people who matter aren't the CEOs. It's not the experts. It's not the big business leaders. The real people who matter are the porters, the cleaners, the bus drivers, the nurses, the Amazon workers. Those are the people who matter in our society. And look, if we've learned anything, if we've learned anything about the strikes that we've heard tonight and the strikes we've seen over the last year, what we've learned is that those people have power. Think about what we've heard from Chris and Darren, whether in Coventry or New York, Yes, you face a common exploitation, but that exploitation gives you a common power to fight back. And what this festival is about, it's about thinking about what is the best way that we can channel that power into a radical challenge to the system. And we have to start by saying that we don't accept the way things are. We won't accept that poverty goes up while the rich get richer. We won't accept that the planet burns while the oil companies make profits. We won't accept that the police can kill Sheikh Ubar and Sean Rigg and not face any charges. And we won't accept that 500 people drowning in the Mediterranean is considered a fact of life and an accident. We have to say another world is possible 
and revolutionary change is necessary. And what I want to finish on is by saying that, look, that fight for a different kind of world won't come easy. We are up against a side who are prepared to take us over the cliff edge. The stakes are incredibly high. But to win that battle, the question of organization matters. If there's anyone in the room who's not a member of the Socialist Workers' Party, it's time to pick a side. It's time to pick a side. Their side is a side of crisis, of exploitation, of war, of racism, and they're taking us over the cliff edge. Our side is a side of struggle, of solidarity, and of socialism. Every single person in the room can make a difference in that fight. Join the Socialist Workers' Party. You're the leadership. Let's fight back. Corner, so I hope to see you all there. Thanks, guys. Bye.